Hello and welcome to Hello and welcome to this Danishar English. My name is Ismail Jalilov. We live and broadcast out outside of Washington DC. If you happened upon our channel, we usually discuss the issues related to Azerbaijan, my native country, and we try to cover the issues that are not um, allowed to be covered on the Azerbaijani media. These are usually human rights issues, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, media rights, the issues that the government of Azerbaijan keeps under tight control. Today we're going to speak to a very valued guest of mine, uh, Rachel Denber, Human Rights Watch, and she's a deputy director for Europe and Central Asia. Let me set it up for you. A month ago or so, there were clashes between ethnic Armenians and ethnic Azerbaijanis in some capitals of Europe and in Los Angeles, California. These clashes led to Azerbaijani Vice President Mehriban Aliyeva and also the wife of the current president, Ilham Aliyev, to make a very strange appeal in my personal esteem. Uh, she mentioned three international human rights organizations. None of them are openly allowed to be working in Azerbaijan. These were Freedom House, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch. She called on them to do some more work related to these ethnic clashes. On the other hand, the president, Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan, has singled out some of them, namely the Freedom House, with which I was briefly affiliated, as almost an enemy of the state in Azerbaijan. To me personally, this was a little bit strange. Uh, three organizations, none of them allowed to work in the country openly, and all of a sudden the vice president uh, mentions them by the name. Today we invited Rachel, uh, Rachel Denber to speak with us, and she joins us from New York City. Rachel, uh, welcome to our show, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ismail. It's lovely to be here with you and an honor to be on your program. Uh, the honor is all ours, trust me. Um, Rachel, when you heard that Mehriban Aliyeva mentioned um, Amnesty, Interna uh, Amnesty International Freedom House and your organization, Human Rights Watch, um, by name, was it surprising? If I'm not mistaken, you were not allowed in the country since 2015, right? Uh, we have not been allowed in the country since, 20, since 2015, that's correct. Uh, was I surprised? Yes and no. Um, I was not surprised because it's not the first time that uh, a, government, a government official in a country that doesn't really welcome Human Rights Watch or that is hostile to human rights uh, invokes our name or invokes our work um, when they have a particular agenda, when they have a particular issue they are concerned about. So it didn't surprise me that she invoked Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International with regard to the ethnic clashes that were taking place because she wanted to uh, attach the authority of a human international human rights organization uh, to her call for concern and protection of uh, ethnic Azeris um, in these cities. Mm -hmm. um, that's a worthy cause. It's a worthy cause to want to protect um, your brethren uh, abroad, uh, just like it's a worthy cause for um, you know Armenia to want to protect its brethren abroad. So by attaching the name of you know Human Rights Watch, which it, no, which I assume Mary um, Banalieva realizes has, I, I hope, some authoritative standing among 
governments and observers around the world, she wants to make clear that this is, I you know, interpret this as her trying to make clear that, you know, um, this is a cause that needs, uh, you know, authoritative attention. So that, that's how I interpret it. It doesn't surprise me. It's not the first time that's happened. Um, you know, when a, I can think of other cases when authoritarian governments uh, use our information to confirm um, or to call out abuse in states that they uh, are critical of. For example, you know, the Russian foreign ministry has more than once cited Human Rights Watch's research on, for example, the United States, or Human Rights Watch's research on Ukraine, or Human Rights' research on, um, on Yemen, uh, in, when it wants to uh, criticize uh, its political adversaries. So they do that when it suits them, you're saying. Um, do you think uh, this was an overture? Do you think she mixed up the addresses? Uh, she knows that uh, when it comes to clashes in Los Angeles, maybe uh, Freedom House, which to my knowledge does not do much work domestically, could not interfere and do something? Or do you think this is an overture? What happens usually in these scenarios when you're mentioned by the very same people and the very same countries that, don't, uh, that tell you you're not welcome there? Is that an overture of sorts? Do you think you will be allowed back in anytime soon? I wish it were an overture because I would very much uh, welcome having a direct dialogue with the Azerbaijani government at a very high level or at, uh, or at any level. Uh, I would very much like for us to be able to do uh, research again in Azerbaijan, to interview people directly in Azerbaijan. Not being able to be in Azerbaijan doesn't stop us from doing research, just like it doesn't, not, doesn't stop us uh, from uh, doing research in other countries when their governments uh, bar us from access. So I, I, but, you know, I wish it were an overture, but honestly, I, I don't think it was because I think it's a bit more cynical than that, right? So um, I think that whoever wrote that for Mehriban Aliyev, Aliyev, um, uh, you know, just thought of, you know, whoever the, the top three or the most resonant three uh, human rights, international human rights organizations they could think of. And that's what, that's what came to their head. You know, it has name recognition. Uh, you know, these organizations have name recognition in London and in, and in um, you know, in, in Los Angeles and other places. So I honestly, I, I, I wish it were an overture. I would welcome an overture. I would love to meet with Mehri Banalieva, uh, with government officials at, at any level, honestly. Right. BBC Azerbaijani quotes you as saying uh, she knows where to find us. Uh, That's right. <laughs> Rachel, if she were to find you, if she were to find you and your organization, if you were allowed to uh, back into Azerbaijan right now, what would your message be to the government of Azerbaijan regarding the human rights situation in the country? And would there be a separate message to the people of Azerbaijan? Because I think both are watching right now. That's a really good question, uh, Ismail. Thank you so much for asking it. I think uh, our main message would be that the crackdown against, uh, against spe free speech, against peaceful political activism against peaceful protests, this crackdown should stop, that it's out of line with Azerbaijan's international uh, and domestic uh, obligations, that um, that it's, it's wrong and it's contrary to human rights obligations to put people in prison because of their political affiliations or their political beliefs, which is happening now in uh, you know in Azerbaijan, particularly against the the Popular Front party, as you know, but also against others, um, that they're you know the, they're being tried, they're being uh, arrested, charged, and eventually tried on charges that nobody believes. You know you know bogus drug charges, bogus hooliganism charges, and and now and and sometimes much even more uh, much more serious charges. Um, that's not affect it's it's wrong it's against their you know azerbaijan's obligations 
and and commitments and it's it's just it's also just not effective if the government wants to promote stability and wants to have a stable prosperous development it needs to end corruption it needs to engage the public rather than alienate it and it needs to ensure that, that there can be a um uh, you know democratic participation that is stable and inclusive right and so uh, I was going to say uh, do, a number of experts interviewed for the same article where the you know the appeal of Mehriban Aliyeva was discussed. They said that the Azerbaijani government and the people lost a lot from uh, these three organizations and maybe countless others not being present in Azerbaijan. What do you think uh, the government lost? What do you think the people have lost? And did it make you less effective in criticizing the government, just a mere fact that you're not allowed in physically to be present in the country? Wow, that's a really great question. So, look, being barred from a country never stops us from doing our work. Uh, it never stops us from speaking out. It doesn't. And in the in a, in a world where, uh, in, in the in the COVID world that we live in, when nobody can, or very few people can travel anywhere, uh, it's more and more acceptable and more and more um, commonplace for interviews to be done online. The core you know, online on Skype, as you as I as you and I are doing right now. You know, the core of our our research methodology uh, is talking to people, getting, hearing their stories, listening to their stories, interrogating the facts, sometimes for, you know, for hours at a time. That's harder to do in a, in a video call or on WhatsApp, but it's not impossible and we're, you know, we're doing it increasingly. So it doesn't, it's, we really miss face-to-face -face contact. Um, I think it's really important to hear people's stories in their, you know, in their presence. Um, but it doesn't, you know, not being present, physically present, doesn't stop us. It, of course, it's, it's a hindrance. Of course, it, you know, it means that we can't easily meet with our colleagues from, you know, Azerbaijan's really, you know, vibrant uh, civil society. Uh, you know, we can't have, you know, roundtable meetings with them in Baku at the at the drop of a hat. Um, uh, you know, to talk about, to talk about our common work and figure out, uh, figure out strategies. Um, uh, you know, we find, you know, we find other ways of communicating as just as everyone is doing, you know, all around the world. So what do the people of Azerbaijan lose out on? Well, you know, people, people in Azerbaijan have, a, you know, have a myriad of problem, um, problems that they face, you know, whether it's the civil and political rights issues that I just mentioned, or whether it's the economic privations that they face due to like the colossal corruption or the lack of uh, investment in social infrastructure, uh, or or inequality, things like that. So I think, um, you know, I think that Azerbaijani human rights groups and Azerbaijani you know journalists who can still be in the country are, you know, they do their I think they do their level best to engage with uh, with the Azerbaijani public, and I have a lot of uh, admiration uh, for them. Um, so. Uh, it's not like I said. It, it just, it's just—it's not going to stop us not being present. Uh, it would be really—I uh, think it's in the government's interests to give us access uh, to the country because you know when you don't give a human rights organization access to the country, it, all it, the only message it sends is, you know, they've got something to hide. Um, it is quite interesting because um, it's no secret. Um, uh, Human Rights Watch and other organizations have been watching Azerbaijan for quite a long time and uh, being very vocal critics of the human rights situation in the country. My question is, do you think that the government is listening or hearing you? These are two very different things, I believe. Um, do you think the government of Azerbaijan currently is concerned with the criticism that it is facing in the area of human rights? Or do you think it's completely ignoring it? What does your um, research show? I think that the Azerbaijani government's position is to pretend, pretend that they're not concerned and then go one step further, be defiantly unconcerned. Right, so Aliyev's statement, uh, Ilham Aliyev's statement uh, 
uh, I think back in the middle of July after there was the after the rally in Baku that ended up with uh, a small group breaking into the parliament and then the arrests that followed. I mean, uh, uh, Ilham Aliyev in his speech made you know he just said very bluntly that you know he made all kinds he made all kinds of allegations about uh, what the what the political opposition was trying to do. He alleged that there was, you know, he alleged a conspiracy theory to overthrow the government and all kinds of other things. And he said, we're going to do what we're going to do. And, you know, if there's, we're not going to pay any attention to criticism from the European Union or from the Council of Europe, that, that it just didn't mean anything. Well, so that was, that was quite demonstrative and defiant. So, but then, you know, we'll have to see what really, what happens in practice. I, you know, governments do that all the time. Um, you know, the Russian government constantly says, we don't care what, you know, we're going to do what we want. We're going to do what, you know, and we don't care what anyone else says about us. But in fact, I, in fact, they do care. And in fact, you know, um, there have been a number of cases that have been, you know, on the agenda at the Council of Europe uh, that over, you know, it took a number of years, but eventually the government did move. The government did budge, you know, possibly, I, I think, I mean, I absolutely believe that if there hadn't been such an outcry uh, over the arrests that took place, and um, and you remember that that period, a very dark period for us, for everybody, um, in uh, late 2013 and then 2014, um, when it just seemed like all of the people we worked with, all of our partners and our dear friends, they at one point they were all in jail, um, and they got they got long sentences, you know, six, seven years, seven and a half years. So I mean, I think if there hadn't been the massive international outcry that that happened and um, the intense criticism and the intense engagement, you know, they might still be in jail. Mm. You know, so I think it does make a difference. Right. Uh, you know, if there were any crisis that would demonstrate to a government that the civil society has a role to play in a country, uh, that would be coronavirus. Do you think that uh, the governments around the world, those that are decimating uh, civil society institutions, like arguably the government of Azerbaijan is doing, do you think they have come to see the light? Do you think they have come to see the usefulness of the civil society structures within the country? Do you think their approach will change after the coronavirus pandemic, or will it will it be even worse? Uh, let's, that's a big loaded question. So let's let's just break it down. First, let's talk about what it is that civil society organizations can do and 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 why they're needed. So um, in some places uh, where, especially where uh, where government services are lacking, it's civil society organizations that are the groups that people who have needs because of due to coronavirus turn to. So uh, they don't know how to get testing. They don't know where to go to for services. Um, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to operate this, you know, the, the stay at home app or, you know, the, you know, the where you have to dial the, um, you know, get a permit, get a permit, for example, to go out and buy groceries. You don't have ser services to, uh, you have to stay at home, but you don't have services to, um, you know, to bring, to bring your groceries. Um, you don't, and you don't know anything about COVID. You don't know, you don't know where to turn to. So many people, uh, you know, in many different countries around the world, rely on non-governmental organizations to provide information, to provide services, to provide assistance, to understand the virus, to understand the threats, to understand how to access service, understand just how to access government services. And then, you know, there's the whole issue of. Um, you know, frontline workers and the, and the and the threats and the risks they face. Whether it's the you know hospital workers who need um, who need but didn't have enough uh, per, you know, personal protective equipment, or whether it's delivery people or delivery uh, you know delivery uh, uh, services um, who you know didn't have protective equipment. So you know who do they turn to to get the word out and to and to uh, organize organize themselves to amalgamate the information about their about their needs and about the problems they face they turn to they turn to civil society organizations to you know and to protect them so um, and this is something you know we've seen in, in a number of different countries um, I and we have also seen in countries you know what what's the outcome when those countries don't have those organizations so I'm thinking about Turkmenistan you know which is a another country that I cover you know 
fairly closely, where there is just where there's no civil society organizations, and and the government completely deny, you know, continues to deny that there's even a single uh, COVID-19 case. Um, so people are many people are just simply panicked. They don't know. They have nowhere to turn to for information, so they turn to. Uh, you know, in, you know, WhatsApp or IMO or other groups uh, abroad to try to, even doctors, to just to try to figure out what's the treatment protocol here? What do we do? How bad is this virus? Um, so, um, and so in a, I, you know, will the governments under, see the light after, the, after we're past this crisis? I certainly hope so. Right. Uh, uh, Belarus and Lukashenko come to mind when it comes to COVID response that you were just talking about. We will get to Belarus, I promise. Uh, let me ask you all the questions about Azerbaijan that I have for now. And feel free to take it uh, into, put it into a wider context of other countries. That is fine, too. Um, it is no secret that human rights organizations, they do not operate in a vacuum. You, The way I understand your work, and correctly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you collect data, you collect information, and then you pass it to the global community, which also includes governments. Do you think the governments around the world have the same level of commitment to human rights issues? Let's start with the United States. Um, do you think they show the same level of interest in human rights violations around the world during this administration and in Europe? And feel free to compare and contrast with any country you, you would like. Um, do you think it is the environment in which it is easier for you to operate now, or is it more difficult? Okay, well, I'm going to have to disappoint you on two counts, Ismail, because although I am an American citizen and I, you know, most I live in America, um, I really don't have any authority to talk about the United States. That's not one of the, one of our key principles at Human Rights Watch is experts talk about the countries and the issues that they're expert in. And I live here. I feel like I'm an expert on Brooklyn, maybe, <laughs> but I uh, only as a resident, but I don't have substantive expertise on my own country. I would always defer to my colleagues uh, who are working our, uh, in our program on the, on the United States, which, by the way, I'd like to point out is the, is the largest program at Human Rights Watch. Um, I know that pro probably possibly the, the government of Azerbaijan or the government of Russia, they think that we have, you know, large numbers of people working on their countries, but in fact, we only have very few, but it's, it's on the United States that we have the largest number of, uh, of, of researchers and resources. And this is so, probably um, out of necessity, right? Yeah, out of necessity and uh, out of, um, yeah, it's a it's a responsibility. It's a big country, and it has a lot of human rights problems, um, and they're and they're complex. They're, they're you know they're they're complex. They're deeply rooted. Um, so I and, and ditto the same for Western Europe. I don't cover other European countries, so I really uh, I really couldn't uh, I really couldn't opine on that or or, or give you any uh, authoritative uh, information about it. But I one thing I, I do want to say. I did want to say though was um, no, we don't operate in a, in a in a vacuum, and our you know our main uh, goal is to stop human rights violations. And often, the way to the reason why the violations are happening and the key to stopping violations is because there's either it's due to either government action or government inaction, right? So even when I mean governments aren't always. The perpetrators of human rights violations. Sometimes they're non-state actors. Sometimes it's they're, they're businesses. Uh, often the problem in ending uh, often it's private parties. Um, but often it's the it's the government's obligation though to provide remedies or to ensure that there is justice uh, for or the, the, the violations come to an end and that, and that the perpetrators are held accountable. And often, you know, if violations are happening in the private, for example, in the private sector, it's often it's because there's a lack of government like regulation. So our job is to is to identify, you know, is to identify who the violator is and then and get them to stop. And that means to, that means presenting those facts directly to the government that's the problem, mm -hmm. um, presenting the information to the public. Um, and also, you know, where it's relevant to present the information to other, any actor that can, that has a relationship with that government 
that can help bring the abuses to an end. And whether that's, you know, in the United States, whether it's, you know, broad range of civil society groups or uh, whether it's uh, other, you know, in, in some countries it's, you know, whether it's also the United, you know, bringing the facts to the attention of the various United Nations agencies, you know, whether it's Azerbaijan, the United States, any country, we share that information with actors who we think are going to help make a difference. Right. Uh, let's look at it from Azerbaijani side. Uh, do you think that the Azerbaijani government, which I believe you described it as dismissive and flagrantly dismissive, if I'm uh, not mistaken, um, do you think it faces uh, the level of criticism that you would you would consider appropriate? And who are the actors when it comes to Azerbaijan? Who are the actors that you would like to be aware of the human rights violations going on in in? I think the word I yeah I think the word I used was demonstratively uh, dismissive. So it's not quite the same as flagrantly. Demonstratively means you're putting on a performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like the. The dismissiveness is in, is intentional because you want to project dismissiveness in order to intimidate whoever whoever you you think your critic is going to be for domestic Do audiences it, or international or does it not matter at all? Well, I think in the instance of uh, Aliyev's speech that he gave in uh, excuse me in uh, July, I think that that demonstrative dismissiveness was intended for international audiences because he actually named them. So, um, and here are the actors, so who are the influential actors? Well, I mean, the, Azerbaijan has a relationship with, uh, with the United Nations, and uh, it reports to a variety of United Nations uh, treaty bodies on, very, on a wide range of human rights issues. Um, it has a, has a relationship and I think a, a rocky relationship with, uh, with the Council of Europe. Uh, which presides over the, the European Court of Human Rights um, and uh, the Parliamentary Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and, and other institutions that have been engaging with Azerbaijan for you know more than 20 years now on its human I think more than 20 years almost 20 years on its uh, on its human rights record um, uh, the, Azerbaijan has a has a relationship with the European Union that it wants to that it has an interest in expanding and, and deepening and vice versa. Um, so uh, that they are an influential actor. There are certain countries that Azerbaijan has a relationship with, uh, you know, important strategic relationship with, so they're influ influential actors. So we want to bring anyone to the table who can help um, uh, make clear why it is that these issues are important. You know, very often there are governments, um, governments that have Problematic human rights records, um, you know, their their publics can't engage them directly, so you know, uh, it becomes it's and it's really a pity, uh, and so it really behooves international actors to engage on these issues because the public uh, can't take those issues directly to the government. Right. You've been coming and going to Azerbaijan for quite some time, and you've been researching it for even longer, from what I understand. When you think of uh, my country of birth, um, I'm reluctant to call it my country because I've lived most of my life in the United States now. But uh, my country of birth, when you think of Azerbaijan, what is the first thing, what is the first case that comes to your mind? Is there a person or a group of persons that come to your mind immediately when you think of Azerbaijan and human rights violations? Oh, Ismail, good question. Well, you're right, I've been coming, I, I had been coming to uh, Azerbaijan for, for many years, starting, I think my first trip was in 1992. Um, actually, the first thing, that, but the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of Azerbaijan and human rights took place before I even started working at Human Rights Watch, and that was Black January. You know, the crackdown, the bloody, uh, vicious uh, uh, crackdown when uh, in 1990 when the Soviet Union brought tanks into the streets of uh, Baku uh, to, um, well, to put, they claimed that they were stopping the, um, you know, the attacks on, our, on ethnic Armenians that had, that had taken place, but they went much farther than that. And it was a huge, it was just a, a terrible, brutal uh, crackdown that resulted in many deaths and injuries and, 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 and repression. So that's 
my um, kind of emotional and intellectual memory of human rights in Azerbaijan starts with uh, starts with Black January. And then, and then that, there are, because there, there are many, there are so many uh, faces that, that I, you know, faces and names of, of incredibly courageous um, investigative journalists and uh, you know who you are and human rights activists who went, who went to jail. She knows uh, who she is, right. She knows who she is. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to phase you. But thank you for bringing up uh, the Hadiji Smailova, one of my personal heroes. You can mention her; it's fine. She's, she's probably watching. One of my personal heroes, and there are and there are many many others, um, many others who don't get named, many others whose cases aren't aren't as uh, aren't as high profile. And one thing I really admire about uh, you know Hadija and others who went to jail. You know, other human rights activists and journalists, the high profile ones who went to prison in 20, you know, end of 2013, beginning of 2014 and longer, is that when they came out, their primary focus, and when they were in prison, you know, the primary focus wasn't necessarily themselves, it was everybody else who was in prison. There was a sense of collective response, uh, um, I don't want to say, collective responsibility in the sense of community responsibility, where, you know, everyone is responsible for helping get, getting everyone else to freedom. Um, does it surprise you on a personal level that in the 21st century, we're talking about countries in the wider geography of Europe, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Russia, and we are dealing with journalists who die doing what they do, who are dying for covering the news, for chasing the story. Does it seem strange and out of place. I'm I'm sorry if I'm asking you a rhetorical question, but uh, being a journalist myself and understanding what it is like to be facing threats for doing your job, um, it sort of comes from a place of personal concern. And I know quite a lot of people in Azerbaijan who are now, some of whom you've mentioned, who are facing threats be simply because of what they're doing. Does it seem um, strange? Does it make you angry? Does it, um, does it depress you? You know, um, one expression that I seem to be using more and more over the recent years is it's, uh, shocking but not surprising so it's the fact that journalists are have get killed in their in their profession or thrown in prison on blatantly bogus charges it's become so routine it's become it's become so disturbingly common that it's almost not surprising anymore but every single time, it shocks me to the core, and it should, because the last thing we should ever become is inured. We should not, we can still be not surprised, but still be shocked and not numb. I think the worst thing that can happen is to become numb uh, and to accept that this is just the new normal, so it, it, I don't feel anything anymore. So it makes me incredibly angry every single time. Rachel, many people, you just mentioned Turkmenistan. It's sort of a litany of questions. Many people in Azerbaijan now say that we're moving in the direction of Turkmenistan. You are in charge regionally of both countries. Which way do you see Azerbaijan moving? Are we becoming less and less tolerant of dissent? Are we moving closer to Turkmenistan or are we in which direction do you think we're moving as a country? Well, I think the government is definitely moving in the direction of less tolerance. Um, but Turkmenistan kind of stands out as a, a pretty extreme example. I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really so extreme there, uh, Ismail. I mean, it's a place that where, you know, they still, they, they don't let people travel abroad or they, they um, you know, the government randomly nabs people off of, 
off of flights, well, when there are flights. <laughs> you know, it's a government that, that doesn't, I mean, for ideological reasons or, uh, or actually idiosyncratic reasons, just won't even accept that they have coronavirus cases when like hundreds of people are obviously dying of, 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 from COVID-19. You know, it's, it's, so ex, it, it's so extreme and, and grotesque. You know, there's not a single, there's not a single NGO you know, human rights NGO that can independent that, that that can operate there. People go to people go to prison just for sending photos abroad. You know, through IMO or through some or other mobile communications. You know the and the sort of um, yeah. I, I don't think that Azer, I would not compare Turkmenistan to any place actually. But that doesn't mean that. But Azerbaijan has been obviously moving in a in a direction of less rather than greater um, tolerance. I mean, every you know every time you know we we um, every time it, it it manufactures another attack on the APFP. That's another tightening of the screw, right? Every time it rounds up, um, uh, you know, young people for spraying graffiti or, or doing something that um, that shows that they're not conformists, you know, rounding up and, and, and arresting them and treating them very harshly, that's another turning of the screw. Um, and so the screws are definitely getting tighter. But I, again, I, I just think that Turkmenistan is just not something you compare any place to. Thank you. You uh, actually uh, made me a little more optimistic. It means the government of Ilham Aliyev has a lot of uh, room for improvement. Uh, let, let's hope it just does. I'm sorry I'm being sarcastic and maybe a little bit inappropriate. But well, look, but Ismail, but Ismail, let me interrupt you to just say there's sure. always hope. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't do what I do day in, every day if I thought that there was no hope. I, I mean, I think that there's I think that someday, you know, the the government of Azerbaijan will let Human Rights Watch do our work and also do our work in the country. Um, I, you know, I hope that day comes sooner rather than later. Um, you know, we we do we do work on all kinds of issues. It's it's to the government's benefit to have Human Rights Watch come to the country and you know and and do research on a whole a whole range of issues. I remember the work we did on. I'll never forget, you know, you asked me a really good question, you know, what what first comes to mind when I think of human rights in Azerbaijan. The first thing that comes to mind, like I said, is, was Black January, but also another thing that comes to mind is, you know, it's the last time I was there. So, you know, that's the thing that's freshest in my head. And I, I went there, the last time I was there was in 2012, in advance of the Eurovision Song Contest, um, when uh, the last you know, the, 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 the final stages in the, you know, evictions campaign to clear out certain air, certain parts of the city to beautify, to beautify it before the, the Eurovision campaign, uh, the Eurovision contest was, were taking place. And, you know, I, I interviewed people, we were, we were making a video to go along with the report we were, that, that we were about to publish. And I, I interviewed people who were, you know, they're, they're not famous human rights activists, they're not journalists. They were, you know, just regular working people who tried to at least get compensa fair compensation for their apartments that were getting, um, that were, you know, that were, you know, that were confiscated and, uh, you know, torn down so that, you know, they could build, a, you know, could finish building a highway or I think that, I think the last one I remember was near the flagpole. Um, so... <clears throat> Um, you know, these people, they, all they wanted was a fair price for their apartments. You know, that's all people have, you know, people need economic, people need economic security. And, you know, when the government is in a position of to, to, to deprive people of their property, you know, they have to, they, they have certain, the government has certain, you know, standards it's supposed to, uh, maintain when, you know, in assessing property and giving people their due. Um, and that's a that is an important part of political stability is ensuring that people are given economic justice. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why people didn't get compensated properly was, uh, you know, was likely due to like wild corruption. And maybe the, maybe at the high levels of government, you know, they they needed to hear that. Maybe they needed, it would have been good for us to, 
um, you know, to have, you know, meaningful conversations with, with, with officials to say, well, look, this is, this is how the compensation process is really looking like, you know, it's, this is not good for, you know, this is not good for, you know, uh, further stability. Um, you know, what, what's going on down there? What's going on at the lower, at the, at the, in the lower levels of authority? Right. Speaking of authority, Zainal Verdi was asking a very interesting question. Is there somebody in the government who helps you or organizations like yours? In other words, uh, without naming names, of course, not to put anybody in peril, do you think that there were forces or groups of people or even individuals that were more receptive to your message when you were talking to them, the people representing the government? Or do you think the government is uniformly opposed or alarmed when they're talking to or interacting with uh, the international human rights organizations? So Ismail, it's hard for me to say with regard to Azerbaijan, whether there are, whether there are folks within the government who are, you know, who don't you know, uniformly follow lockstep the, the, the line of hostility. I'm sure that there are. And I, you know, I, I have, uh, you know, I know that in other, you know, and I won't name names, but I know that in, um, you know, in, in numerous governments in countries that where we work, where there might be a, a rather hostile line at the very top, at, at other levels, there's, you know, there, there is openness. Um, let's talk about Belarus a little bit. Uh, Belarus is a country that is described as one of the last ve- vestiges of dictatorship in uh, wider Europe. It's not a member of the Council of Europe. Azerbaijan is, on the other hand, um, irony of ironies. Um, do you think that these two countries have something in common? Do you think that the people of Azerbaijan looking looking at what's going on in Belarus right now, do you think there is a lesson to be learned? Or do you think that these two uh, countries are comp- completely incomparable when it comes to the uh, f- freedom or striving for freedom? Um, I try not to compare countries. Uh, I, can, uh, I can say a couple of words about, uh, about the situation in Belarus. I think that only people in Azerbaijan know what their, how they compare to you know, what the public in uh, Belarus is striving for. Um, but, you know, the situation in Belarus right now is that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been coming out um, since August 9th after the announcement of the improbable results of the presidential vote. Um, and uh, for the first, you know, for the first three days, there was a, most of the, pro- most of the, pro- some of the protests were uh, involved real clashes between street protesters and police, um, you know, things got ugly. Um, but otherwise, uh, almost all of the protests were absolutely peaceful and the police threw stun grenades. They started, the police started with stun grenades, rubber bullets, tear gas, and water cannons. So that was, that was the, that was their opening volley. Um, and then there was some protester violence in return, but otherwise protests were exclusively peaceful. And for three days, the police, the riot police, I should say, just, you know, they rounded up almost 7,000 people uh, within a couple of days. Um, hundreds were brutally tortured. Uh, and um, internet went, was severely interrupted. So uh, most mobile, communi- mobile, mobile internet was severely interrupted. Um, and so for three days, the country was sort of in the dark about what was going on. Meanwhile, these uh, these like police vans would like roam around Minsk and just grab young people randomly uh, if they were out on the street because being out on the street meant that you were you had a political agenda. Just being out on the street. So um, after those three days ended and um, internet came back on, people started to get released from police detention, and it was just a sea of bruised bodies, broken bones sexual abuse, just really horrific stuff, really, really horrific. And people pour it out into the streets to, to protest. So, um, and those protests have been, have been continuing. It's a, it's a, I think it's important to underscore that it's not a, it's not a pro Europe protest. It's not an anti-Russia protest. It's a, 
we want it's a protest for free and fair elections and it and it's a protest against being treated like meat do you right? think all dictatorships and and like this do you think this is a trend that will happen in other places and of course i'm wondering about azerbaijan i don't know you know it's not over yet in belarus you know um i think that the government there is counting on the protests running out of steam like the the, the severe like the The massive roundups have stopped, although there are the, the massive roundups have stopped. Everyone's documenting now the, the, the abuse that took place during those three days. Um, but I think that the, the government is counting on protesters running out of steam. The, the government is counting on attrition. The government is counting on the, the labor strikes that had started in many state factories to, to, to either to run out of money or Uh, or to run out of people because I mean eventually they're going to start threatening people with loss of with the loss of their jobs <clears throat> um, and they're I think they're waiting to so they're, they're waiting to see the numbers decline and before I think they'll bring down really bring down the hammer they've already started to really bring down the hammer because journalists have started to leave Belarus um, and they've already started like bigger like wider criminal cases but they haven't started like They haven't started to really bring down the hammer again. They've arrested a lot of journalists again. So um, will that happen in Azerbaijan? Really, I mean, it's I. That's really hard for me to say. But what I what I think isn't hard to say is that whenever these uh, public uprisings happen, other autocrats around the region get very nervous, and that's when they start to crack down. So that big crackdown that happened in 2013, 2014, well, mostly in 2014 in Azerbaijan. You know, the the excuse was we don't want to. We don't want Maidan to happen here. Mm -hmm. So they just you know, they just use that as an excuse. Colored revolution. We don't want that to happen here. Boom. That's our. That's our. They use that as their um, pretext for you know all kinds of arbitrary arrests, trumped up cases. They don't want you know to, to get rid of critical voices that are just you know uh, that are inconvenient and that you know, that are inconvenient to the government because they're challenging the government for more, to have more transparency, to have more fairness, to have more equality. Um, <clears throat> You're almost describing the situation with Vladimir Putin and Alexei Navalny. Do you think uh, the events in Belarus made Putin um, nervous to that extent that he somehow allowed something to happen to Navalny? Um, well, I'm not a criminal investigator. I, I can't say I can't say you know who poisoned Navalny. I think it's pretty obvious that he was poisoned. I don't think there's any evidence. I mean, I, I really can't say whether the Kremlin knew about a plan to poison Navalny. There are numerous theories about you know why it happened. There are uh, political experts who think that um, you know what really what we really need to focus on is the fact that. Russia is a country where non-systemic opposition people have ter where terrible things happen to them. I mean, you know, you don't, you know, you don't need to have the Kremlin calling the shots. There are all, you know, in the in these cases, <clears throat> you know, there are all kinds of political operators who, you know, who take action based on what they think are signals from the top, right? So that's why the, you know, it's really hard. Although it's very hard to say who is responsible for poisoning Navalny. Um, for example, you know, it's not hard to say, well, let's see what happens with the investigation. Is there going, is there going to be a, a really thorough and effective investigation? And if there's not, then that will, you know, then that speaks volumes. But do you think in a country, I, I know I'm asking you to read the tea leaves, but do you personally think that something of this magnitude, uh, poisoning, of an opposition leader in a country like Russia could happen without the Kremlin's knowledge. Is it plausible? Yeah, I think it, I, I, absolutely. I do. I think, I think in today's Russia, it is plausible. Right. I think it is plausible. Yeah. It doesn't mean that there's no level of official complicity at some level, but I think it's absolutely plausible. Right. Um, let's go back to Azerbaijan for a second. Um, quite often, uh, people from various uh, fractions or parts of the Azerbaijani civil society or what's left of it, they often uh, accuse the West and larger human rights organizations or 
donor organizations of playing favorites when it comes to Azerbaijan. I don't know to what extent that criticism is fair or deserved. Do you think when uh, dealing with the Azerbaijani civil society, uh, do you think you're talking to all sides? Do you think the effort is made to get a balanced and um, a rounded, uh, informa- well-rounded information from the country? Or do you think that it's easier for people, for practical reasons, for um, uh, nothing sinister, but for practical reasons, to talk to people that you already know? It's a really good question, Ismail, and it's a really Im- important point. You know, no one's perfect. I can't say that Human Rights Watch is perfect. We make this, you know, there are probably all kinds of people we, we, we miss and all kinds of all types of uh, issues that we don't get to in sectors of uh, sectors of society that we're not reaching. Um, that's a challenge for us. It's an important challenge for us. There's always, you know, um, there are always issues that I wish that we could work on and we're not working on. Uh, I think that um, uh, I think it's a I think it's a fair you know I think it's a fair criticism. I think that um, you know I, I think that uh, multilateral actors need to take a stronger interest in all kinds of issues in Azerbaijan, not just the um, you know not just the, the 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 more straightforward you know issues of. Um, of freedom of speech and freedom of freedom of assembly and political competition; those are those are really important issues. But there are many. Obviously, there are you know there are many other issues that need to be tackled. I think it's not. I think if it happens and when it happens, I don't think it's out of. Uh, I don't think it's intentional, but uh, but it's a challenge to all of us. Um, it's no secret that uh, international organizations operate with limited budget and a limited number of people. Your abilities and your funding is not infinite. Um, how does it happen? How do these organizations prioritize as to which country to pay attention to? Um, countries like Azerbaijan, uh, no secret, you've been making efforts for years with Probably very little result, not just Human Rights Watch. I'm talking about the human rights community, global human rights community in general, Europe, America, what have you. Does it make a country like Azerbaijan sort of like drop in the list of your priorities when you see no results, no outcomes, when there are no success stories to report? How does it all work together? Well, first, I just want to point out that... um we have one person who covers the three, who is responsible for all the three South Caucasus countries. So that, uh, I mean, that, that should say something. Um, a whole person, huh? That's that's nice. Well, no, we have, yeah, um, with with assistance, with help. Um, so, well, look, I think that there's an undeniable dynamic among. You know, in human rights organizations and in among donors, to and, and understandably to want to show your impact. Everyone wants to show impact. But, you know, we're you know we're not we're not in this to be historians. As much respect I have for the you know the profession of you know, for professional historians, we're you know we're a mission-driven organization. We want to, we want to change people's lives. We want to improve people's lives. How you measure that impact, you know, especially when you're dealing with a very stubborn autocracy, is very difficult. You know, it's uh, if if we only worked in the countries where we knew we could make a difference, where if we only worked in the countries where we knew that making a difference would be easy, and let me rephrase the the answer, then we would only work on like a handful of countries. And and then what happens to the rest? There, uh, you know, why why is it the right thing? Like, look, look Turkmenistan. You, you mentioned Azerbaijan, which is very challenging, <laughs> but but even so, I mean, like we like we said at the beginning of the hour, if there hadn't been a big campaign by. Um, you know, by many human rights organizations and by multilateral organi- by multilateral intergovernmental organizations to get those to get all of those activists out of and journalists out of prison, they might still be in prison today. So there is there. I mean, there is impact. Um, 
but like, does that mean that Turkmenistan, which is one of the most obdurate and uh, immutable, seemingly aut autocracies uh, on the face of the planet, does that mean, ah, you know, let's just let's just write it off. Let's just forget it. People in Turkmenistan, just you know, there's not going to be any help. There's not going to be any voice for you on the outside. Should we all just forget it, just because, and give in? and just uh, declare, you know, de declare Bernie Muhammadov the victor? Hell no. <laughs> the reason I'm asking this question is uh, one of our viewers, um, Fakhradin Zamanov, is asking in Azerbaijani, if the people outside do not see the people of Azerbaijan come to action, nobody's going to care about us. Is that true, though? Um, does the level of attention increase? We can look at Belarus right now. Uh, attention to Belarus, given pre-protests and post-protests, did it really change? Yes. I mean, obviously, when a when a country is in uh, in tumult, it, that attracts a lot of attention around the world. I have to say, though, that the attention eventually moves on. With every crisis, I mean, it grabs global attention. It grabs policymakers' attention without a doubt, but then people move on. And, then, and like I said before, that's what Lukashenko is counting on. No, I mean I think that the whole one of the main purposes of organizations like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International or Freedom House is to also look at issues that that aren't at the surface and to bring them out and to amplify them. You know, to find those to find those. Uh, you know instances where human dignity is being trampled and to make it visible. So because without, because there's never any change without some kind of visibility. Rachel, uh, if a miracle happened, then Mehriban Aliyeva were uh, another guest on our show alongside you. If you had this opportunity to talk to her, uh, first of all, is my premise wrong? Is it more is it easier to speak to a woman, especially a mother, about human rights? Do you think uh, she should be more receptive? And what would you say to her if she were here side by side? Just let's say a miracle happened and she came. I would not genderize it, uh, Ismail. <laughs> um, I think women can be just as obdurate as, as men. Um, uh, and uh, they can be just as hostile. I, I have also had really um, good conversations with men, with male uh, policymakers who were very good listeners and uh, could be moved. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't genderize it. Um, what would I say? Well, first I'd say that they uh, that they need to release uh, folks, the folks from the APFP who are in prison right now for for no reason. Um, uh, that they have to stop using COVID as uh, as a flimsy pretext to arrest people. Uh, that's that, that it's wrong and it's not helping people. It's not uh, you know you're not supposed to you know abuse uh, you know you're not supposed to criminalize um, uh, these aspects of COVID, which is something that the government is doing. Um, so what else would I say? I would say to open up you know that they have only everything to gain by um, by creating an atmosphere that makes it possible for human rights organizations, civil society organizations, and journalists to be able to freely operate. There would be a much less contentious relationship between civil society and, and the government if there was an atmosphere of freedom rather than an atmosphere of uh, hostility and embattlement. Well, uh, when I genderize the issue. Um, I hope it was positive bias. I hope <laughs> people understood that because the role model for me has always been my late mother. Um, when we talk about PFPA prisoners, we should also mention probably Tofi Gyagoblu of Tofik Musavat. Tofi Gyagoblu of Musavat, absolutely. His who court actually... case was today, actually. Um, and you touched upon a very interesting question, which I have to ask you. I would be amiss if I didn't, and I'm very mindful of your time. Um, COVID, it's, it seems that the issue of the pandemic has been used by various governments for various purposes to uh, limit the uh, freedom of assembly here, to limit the freedom of information there. 
Um, can you comment, is there a trend in the area that you oversee, Central Asia and Europe? Is there a trend, a dynamic that you can identify in various countries in how the autocratic regimes or regimes susceptible to autocratic tendencies are exploiting the coronavirus pandemic for their own uh, means and purposes? Well, there were definitely a couple of examples uh, where governments used uh, the need to prevent COVID as a pretext to detain people uh, who were otherwise you know, engaged in peaceful protests. Um, and there were examples of this in um, in or peaceful protests or other or other criticism. So there, there were definitely examples of this in Azerbaijan. There was examples that we documented in Russia, and um, and I believe in uh, in Belarus. No, not in Belarus. Sorry, um, I can't remember the other example. But definitely in those two countries. Uh, others might come to my head later. Um, and uh, and then you know and then it's utterly transparent that they're they're abusing COVID as a grounds, and then they what what do they do? And I mean, in Russia at least, they throw them into police wet, you know vans with lots of other people without masks or in you know enclosed spaces where, and then send them off to police stations where they're, you know, they could very easily uh, get COVID. Um, and you know the same happened in in, in Azerbaijan. So um, and I, I think another trend is that in, 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 in a number of countries, you know, there were um, apps that were developed um, to trace people, to track people uh, who were either COVID positive, uh, who tested positive coronavirus or who had respiratory symptoms. And these, you know, these apps, I, I, I fear, um, you know, they, some of them were quite invasive. Uh, so it wasn't really just about, you know, your, your, your health status. Uh, it, you know, it actually, you know, tracked where you were going and you know, made you take pictures of yourself and things like that. And then the data stays on file uh, for, you know, for longer than it needs to. So I, I, I worry a little bit that, that, that the experience of having had this kind of surveillance will be, of having created and imposed this kind of surveillance will become very tempting for autocratic governments in the future, and maybe even not only autocratic governments in the future, and that and that it will feel increasingly normal for people, for the public. So um, that's a, that's a, I think so, something that we've seen across in, in dif different parts of of the region. And um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say tracking people and people even complying and actively cooperating would be a new norm. Uh, you're worried about a new that. normal. That's right. Yes, absolutely worried about that. Well, Rachel, uh, we only asked for one hour of your time, and uh, we've been on the air for exactly one hour. I thank you for your time. I just hope we had we have another opportunity was, to discuss everything. It was really a pleasure to talk with you, Ismail, and I do just want to say that um, uh, I, I want to actually say his name, Tofik Yakobu's name. Uh, it's time to it's time to release him. He is in prison for no reason whatsoever. And um, I, I'm very glad that I got to meet him uh, when he was uh, in the United States a couple of years ago. And uh, Tofik, if any of your family are listening, um, my best wishes to you. Can you say that in Russian? Because he would probably be more likely to understand you in Russian and uh, so is his family. Oui. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, and we hope you. to see you very soon. Very soon. Спасибо большое. До свидания. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Um, at the end of the conversation, it turned out uh, Rachel and I can uh, perfectly communicate in Russian. We hope next time we try to do that um, to gain a, an even wider audience. Uh, but I believe our conversation today, regardless of the language in which it was conducted, was very important. And I'm truly hoping that the people who make decisions be it in the government of Azerbaijan, non-governmental actors, be it uh, in governments around the world, 
I heard the messages that our guest had uh, for them today. We thank you for your time, and we hope you join us in our future broadcasts. From Washington, D.C., Ismail Jalilov, thank you and good night.